Conscious Discipline and our time together. Conscious Discipline is a comprehensive social and emotional discipline program that you can see on the screen. Look at the screen. You can see it's comprehensive by the pyramid. It starts at the bottom. Watch at the bottom. It's based on brain research and it's based on brain research for two reasons. One, it helps us see the relationship between brain behavior and between the brain and our behavior and something very, very profound. It allows us to look at the strategies we use to discipline children in a new light. Often we think, well, what can I do to get them to bed? What can I get them to do to finish, to finish their homework? What could I get them to do um, to be more compliant? And we think there's some trick or strategy or some quick thing we can do. But the brain research shows us that how we discipline children, how we respond to their noncompliance, how we respond to their upset, to their conflicts, conflicts has a profound impact on them for the rest of their life. In essence, it decides, it determines, influences, influences who they are and who they will become. In conscious discipline, we focus on the adults first and children second. We do this because we're the models, we're the teachers, and if we lack skills, so do that, so will they. The seven powers for conscious adults is the focus of this webinar series. Okay, now last time we focused on the power of perception. So we, we focused on the power of perception that said if you want permanent behavior change, you must have perceptual shifts. And that is huge because in conscious discipline, we want permanent behavior changes. So read these two things with me. So you'll look at them on the screen. And it says, behavior management systems that merely manipulate the surface behavior of children will never build deep values and internal controls. And then a quote from me, discipline is not something you do to children, it's something you develop within them. It says something you're developed, but it's something you develop within them. Okay, so the big thing is then, how do we create this permanent behavior change? That's what we're after. We're constantly after permanent behavior change, not putting out little fires and doing quick fixes. So what it is, is how we have to come and ponder some very, very deep questions. And so these deep questions are, who do we believe we are, and how do we believe the world is? Now you might say, what in the world does this have to do with discipline? But these are profound questions that as you see as we work through this session today, you're going to see have huge impacts on the classroom. Okay, so how we see ourselves, how we see the world, creates the world we live in. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story. So some of you might have heard this story. So. Two people are moving to a new city and they walk down and they run into this wise man. And they ask, the first person asks the wise man says, you know, what's the city like up ahead? How is it going to be for me? And the guy says, well, how was the city where you just came from? He says, and the person said, oh, the people were mean, they were nasty, they were horrible. And the guy goes, oh, that's how it will be up there too. And the second person goes up to the same wise man and says, I'm moving up to the city also. How will be the, how will that city be for me? How is that city up a, that I'm moving to? And he says, well, how was it from where you came? And the other person said, well, it was, the people were wonderful, they were kind, it was a loving, caring community. And he says, well, that's how it will be up at your next city also. So we carry these beliefs with us and we create our world from them. Now today we're talking about the power of unity. And that basically says that we're all in this together. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to ponder this. I want you to think about this. There's seven billion of us living on the planet. Do you believe these seven billion people are separate people, like we would imagine billiard balls? So do you think that they're a bunch of billiard balls? We're all separate individualistic individuals like billiard balls, and we impact each other every now and then when we bump into each other. Or do you believe that we are, are somehow interconnected with each other and our planet, influencing each other in many subtle yet powerful ways? 
how you answer this will have a powerful impact on how you, set, how you raise your children and how you set up your classroom. Now, conscious discipline believes in the power of unity, that we are all in this together. And it, and it talks about, or it's a belief that means we're literally somehow all interconnected. And we don't know how this mysterious force works. It may be something like gravity or electricity, but somehow we're all in this same sense uh, of, uh, of quantum energy together. Now, how do we know this is true? Well, we don't. So, you can do it three ways. So, how do we know that this would be true, that we're all literally interconnected? Well, one way is through our personal examples. So, if you can think about um, these freaky moments you have. I don't know if y'all have had freaky moments like me, but you know, the, the phone will ring and you'll go, oh, well, that's my sister. And you know right off the bat that's your sister. Or you're thinking about someone and they call you. Or you've had these moments where um, you'll be sitting in a traffic light and you'll just know someone's staring at you and you'll turn your head and lo and behold, they are staring at you. Um, so we've all had those moments that we would call unusual and freaky, but yet they're common amongst all of us on the planet. We've also seen, like you're seeing on your screen now, is the, uh, the fascination in nature where we see these flocks of birds that somehow change directions and maneuver almost simultaneously. Or you'll see, uh, and I've done this myself because I love to scuba dive, but you'll see this in, while you're down in the, in the ocean. You'll go up to a school of fish and as soon as you move towards them, all of them skirt instantly as if they, they somehow communicated on a very, very deep level to shift directions. Or let's say that you're not going to go on these personal experiences of yours and you want something a little more hardcore to prove that we're connected. You might rely on the, on the scientific community. So those of you who are, are more scientific about this, just Google yourselves crazy because I'll give you a little bit of information you can go look it up. So at the University of Arizona, they're doing research on global consciousness. At Princeton University, they're doing the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research, which is PEAR, and they dis could discern when big events happen in the world, like 9-11, so I encourage you to go look at that. You can go to the Insti In International Institute of Biophysics, Cambridge University, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, HeartMath, and they'll all talk about the research they're doing on intention. Even to the smallest thing about how we cut a tomato and the tomato right before we cut it goes ah! and its energy changes because it knows somehow the knife is coming. So if that is what kind of blows your skirt up, you go look at the scientific community. Some of you though, however, will try another avenue and it might be through the research community. I mean through the religious community. This is the golden rule in 13 religions. Actually there is not a religion that does not have a version of the golden rule. So the next screen will show you some of these. You'll see it Judaism, Christianity, Islam, uh, Buddhism, Confucianism. So I love Christianity. We know that one. Do unto others as we would have, you, have them do unto you. Uh, Judaism, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. And it goes on the next page and you can see even in, in native spirituality we are as much alive as we keep the earth alive. Uh, it goes on and on. All religions have the same thing. Somehow, every religious group came up with the same principle that we must treat each other as we would want to be treated and there's something underneath that that's so profound uh, that everyone wants to obtain that uh, lofty value. Okay, so Whatever you believe, whatever you believe about our level of connection, we have non-questionable research that states the essential impulse of all life is a will to connect. We have this um, deep connection, rather than competition, is the is our most uh, humane quality. Often we think that, uh, I, you know, when I talk about uh, making schools that are based on um, cooperative classrooms like the school family, people go, oh, but what about competition? We need competition. Competition is what our society is about. And if we don't prepare kids to compete, they'll not make it in the world. 
But if you look at the research, it is not competition which keeps us uh, in optimal functioning states. It is connection. And we have an innate preference to choose cooperation. Children as young as four and five months of age pick in research little cooperative bears over non-cooperative bears. We have an innate preference for democracy. They used to think that these big old uh, elks that would fight it out, you'd have these two male, male elks and they would bull it out. And the, the one who wins then gets to boss around the whole herd of elk. Well, that's not the truth. Uh, what happens, how you make a, a decision in any mammal that works in a herd is when 51% of those mammals think it's a wise choice. All the other animals follow that group decision and that male elk is sitting there going, oh my goodness, <laughs> they've left me, they've left me. So we have this innate desire to care, to be empathic, to bond. Now I went to Africa this year and if you look at these guys, this is a, a picture of uh, some young boys who've just become warriors and gone through a ritual of circumcision. And in this ritual, uh, you can see they're, they're quite old, but pretty much what they've got to do is they've got to lay still with no anesthesia and in front of their whole tribe, and they can't make a sound, and they can't fight, nor can they cry while they get circumcised. And if they do that, they get to be a warrior. If they pull away or jerk or cry or even a tear in their eye, they are shunned for life from their tribe. Now, as you can see, these boys uh, made it, so yay for them. Um, just the thought of it makes me want to faint. But um, what it shows us is what research says, is that um, rejection hurts and ostracization, shunning, would you use that word, it's easier for me, and shunning will destroy you. So if you look at this next slide, what we found out is that the brain areas activated by physical pain are almost identical to the pain areas by social pain. So when you see that commercial on TV, it says, where does depression hurt? And it goes everywhere. It's true. Rejection physically hurts the body. It's the same pathways. And I'm, I'm not a doctor, so don't anybody believe what I'm just about to say, but the research does show that if you get kicked to the curb by a loved one, you can take a Tylenol and feel slightly better. So we know that the drugs that help physical pain also help uh, social pain. Now, it used to be that we thought uh, kids with high health high self-esteem, I mean everybody remembers this, let's tell them how great they are. We used to believe that children with high self-esteem um, had good psychological health and the kids who had low self-esteem had, had you know, anxiety and depression and other psychological problems. And then they did research and I found these kids in gangs were having high self-esteem and they couldn't figure this all out. Well it turns out it's not about self-esteem at all. It's about the underlying construct that self-esteem represents, which is the state of social connectedness. So kids who are connected have psychological well-being. Kids who are not connected have uh, deep, deep pain. And we've seen that with school shooters. Ostracized children, what happens is once you get rejected, the pain system comes on in your body. Once the pain system comes on, it shuts down the, the higher centers of your brain so you no longer can make healthy choices and in that locked-in state without any ability to self-regulate that pain becomes so great and then you end up in an aggressive state where you either commit suicide or you kill uh, those around you. Also at the University of Exeter, this is in Britain, they found that the most important predictor of health greater than diet and exercise is the number of groups to which you belong and the number of strong relationships you have. So for those people who are too busy to connect in the holiday season, you best just put down the wrapping paper and go talk to a friend. Okay, so what does all this mean? So we've gone around this power of unity and I'm just kind of giving you different bits and pieces. So what does this all come down to? Well, 
it comes down to how we're going to create our classrooms and we're going to how do we help these children. There's a whole research study that said touching a teddy bear mitigates the negative effects of social exclusion. In other words, just hugging a bear. That power of touch, if you can't get it from an animal or a human, just try a stuffed animal and that will help soothe you. When we do Conscious Discipline in high school, one brave soul teacher used a teddy bear. And she brought in a teddy bear. Well, actually, it was the mascot of the school, but it was a teddy bear. And when she'd see these kids in a deep funk, or especially the ones who'd been excluded, the outgroup, so to speak, she would just take the bear. It could be an algebra class, it could be an English class, it could be a science class. She'd just take the bear and just toss it across the class, around the classroom. And as soon as they caught the bear, their body would change. They would relax. And they could get back to work. And research supports this. That uh, So if you have a child who has is, is not someone's friend in class, it's time for us to reach out to them. But if we can't reach immediately, give them a teddy bear and we'll start from there. All right, so what I'm coming down to then is what does this mean in actuality in our classrooms? Okay. So if you were a billiard ball person, if you think we're separate individuals, then, which is what we're raised with in our Western culture, that we are individuals, we need to be rugged individuals, and, you know, what I do is my business, and you get out of my business, and, you know, I'm not messing with you, and don't you tell me what to do, and all that, that rugged individualism. The focus when you believe you're separate from other people is on getting. So... I have to get my needs met. How do I get enough? How do I get you to like me? How do I get you to appreciate me? How do I get you to compliment me? And so all our little helpful things, kind of you, if you really were honest and ripped them back, it's really about getting. And if you even look at politics, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. So it's not really I'm giving to you, I'm doing nice to you because I want to get you to be nice back to me. Now, what happens when we do all this getting? So who gets to get the most? Well, the best. So if you're the best at something, you get the most. So if you're the best at school, you get to be student of the week. You get to be line leader. If you just sit quietly all day, you get to go to the water fountain first. So the best people get stuff. And then the ones who aren't the best, well, they just don't get anything. And so this perpetuates competition. So we create competitive societies so that we can all kind of climb on top of each other's back trying to get to the top. And then what happens is we end up with a, a mentality of scarcity. There's not enough. Now, this is amazing to me that we can live in the most powerful, wealthiest world in the uh, wealthiest country in the world and I could ask anybody, oh man, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. Because we've built this into our model of competition. We've built this which demands scarcity. And then we create our classrooms on this. And those who, you know, I want to get the gummy bear. I want to get this. And I want to get all these things. And what happens is we rely on rewards and punishments. And we create our classrooms based on the same model. And we create two groups of people, the haves and the have-nots. Now, in conscious discipline, we believe we're all literally connected. Now, I used to play this game uh, when I walked down in the airports. I would play this game. We've having technical difficulties. That's why you can't see me. Otherwise, you'd be see me. And I must admit, I dressed up for you, so I'm sad now that you can't see me. Actually, I'm only dressed from my waist up, which is what you can see. I do have on flip-flops. So, I used to play this game with myself when I'd walk through the airport. And uh, I would look at all the people. Now, my mind can get, hopefully, uh, you can relate to this, my mind can get a little critical. And I'm thinking maybe yours can too, because I was raised on this notion that we're separate and that I try to get things. And if I want to give things away, like I can give my criticism to someone away, therefore I'm free of it. I can give my guilt to you by blaming you, and I'm free of guilt. It's never worked so far, but I keep trying to give all this stuff away. Um, uh, so what happens is, I walk down in the airport, and I'll see people, maybe they're a little overweight, and I'll go, oh my God. I mean, I don't say this out loud, but I'll go, thank God that's not me. You know, at least I'm only 30 pounds overweight, not 100. 
And then I realized, wow, what if all these people walking around on the planet were just a cell in my body? How does that help me by looking at my liver cell over there that looks a little plump and being nasty to my own cell? What if I started hating my liver? What if, what if we were the cells of one body of humanity and I started hating my own personal liver? Or I didn't like my kidneys for some reason and every day I'm like, oh, you stupid kidney. I can see how, our, how cancer could take over the planet. And maybe we have a cancer of separateness uh, that we need to deal with first. So if we did a different way in consciousness, we call the school family. What if we did it differently? What if we look through the lens of compassion? And compassion says, I see through that lens of connectedness. And so that everybody I see, everything is a part of me. What would happen then? Well, we wouldn't focus on getting, we would focus on giving. Because if I gave to you love, I gain in love. If I give to you appreciation, I gain in it. If someone makes a wonderful uh, product or something and it's gloriously um, successful, I don't feel jealous. I'm like, oh my gosh, they paved the way for the rest of us. In the classroom, we, the children are like, how can I help you be successful? as opposed to how can I help us all be successful as opposed to how do I trash you so I can be student of the week. And we create this sense of compassion and giving in the classroom. And so kids don't say, what do I get if I'm good? Kids start saying, how do I give of my goodness to one another? How can I be of service? And if we build these compassionate classrooms, then within them we teach them the skills of cooperation and on top of that we place healthy competition. We've got a world we can count on. But if we build our classrooms on competition and then add on to it more competition and add on to that more competition, that's called war. And in this season we call uh, of the holiday season, you often hear uh, this phrase, peace on earth. And so we need to start with where that begins, and that starts with us. Also, I used to think too um, that if we start seeing each other as connected, uh, the idea of revenge becomes uh, impossible because I'm only hurting myself. So I hope that from this seminar, you can start to see the fundamental shift. So if you'll look down, here's our fundamental shift in intention. It's if you go from the power of unity to replace this sense of separateness, you will make a fundamental shift in how you discipline and guide children. You will go from how do I make the child behave, which is really how do I get them to do something. Every article I've ever written or every, uh, I'm doing a radio show next to, well, uh, this Thursday. And the first question I'll guarantee that the person will ask me is, how do you get the child to do something? And I have to spend five minutes before I answer that question because we're asking the wrong questions. The question is, how do I help the child be successful? I can't tell you how many people have come to my house and say, my child's failing math, they're failing this in high school, and I've tried to get them to do this. I've taken away the car. I've promised them money if they're successful. And I've asked them, well, have you helped them be successful? How about a tutor? I'm not going to give them a tutor unless they show me some effort first. So we're making this huge shift, huge shift. The next one is, instead of how do I get the world to go my way, it's how do I find my personal gifts and then give them back and contribute to making a better world for all. Now, often when I speak to groups of people, at the end of they'll come up to me and say, my goodness, it was like you were in my house. You were in my head. It's like you follow me around all day. You see all this junk that goes on in my head. Well, maybe on some level, we all kind of tap into each other's minds. We all have the same needs on some level. And we all can relate to some of our own struggles. And 
it could be that it's not that I've been to your personal home, but we've all kind of been to each other's home, and that home is called uh, the home of humanity.